be that hand. I'll pray for you. Oh, thank you, son. Amen. So tonight, the title of tonight, tonight's message is Take Courage. And we're finishing up in the book of Acts here tonight. And um, I'm definitely excited uh, to finish this because it means we're going to be able to start the book of Revelation this next week. And uh, it's an exciting study. It's a long study. We'll be in that book for, for definitely at least a year. Um, but I think it'll be an exciting time for us to grow and to learn some things about the book of Revelation. Uh, but we're not there yet. We're going to finish up in the book of Acts uh, tonight. And we're going to talk about a subject that's really important to us as believers. Um, you know, sometimes we feel weak and weary as we go through life. Uh, just because of circumstances, sometimes the, the pressures of life itself can kind of weigh on us. And we've got to keep in mind, as we're going to learn tonight, um, that there are times that we need to do some things that we can take on some courage to continue to move on, uh, just in life and in life circumstances and what we're dealing with. We're going to see that in a couple of different circumstances tonight as we uh, finish up Acts chapter number 28 uh, this evening. And I'm very thankful you guys didn't know my, my computer crashed last week after we got done studying. I went upstairs to do some stuff and it wouldn't even power on anymore. And I thought, oh boy, I'm going to be in trouble. I've got a lot of work on that computer, um, including the whole entire year's worth of study in the book of Revelation. And like a genius that I am, I never backed up any of my stuff, brother. I don't know what I was thinking. So... Uh, um, Praise God, Andrew was able to get that going tonight, and uh, I've got that uh, backing up on a, on a hard drive that Chris donated to us, and so uh, here in a couple of days, all my, inform all my stuff, my study stuff will be loaded on there, and I'll, I'll feel so much better. I'm thankful to be able to have the church computer to be able to provide this PowerPoint for us here tonight. Um, but considering taking courage, as we look at Acts chapter number 28, um, we're going to be starting down in uh, verse number 11. Uh, tonight, Acts chapter number 28 and verse number 11, the Bible says this, And after three months we departed in a ship of Alexandria, which had wintered in the isle whose sign was Castor and Pollux. And so we remember that Paul was on his journey from Jerusalem. Um, I do have a new map in the deck for you tonight that you'll be able to look at. It has the same information on there, a little more detail as far as names of cities and whatnot. Um, but you remember this red line that's over here, um, this is the final journey for Paul as he left over here in Jerusalem and has made his way and he's going to Rome. Right now, remember, the last studying we did in the, in the previous verses in Acts 28, we were right here on this island of Malta. That's where they crashed. That's where they shipwrecked at, if you remember. And so now they're making the journey from this little island here up to make the final trip to get to Rome where Paul has appealed unto Caesar for his case. And you remember, Jesus Christ Himself appeared unto Paul as Paul went into Jerusalem, where Paul really, I think, thought he was going to lose his life there. He goes into Jerusalem and Jesus says, Good work, Paul. Paraphrasing, of course, right? Good work, Paul. Now I get to send you to Rome to do some of these similar things and to spread the Gospel. And so Paul has been on his way. He's been shipwrecked here. We learned last week that, remember, that viper latched onto his arm? Um, and he, he just shook it off into the fire and continued on there. Um, great influence Paul has been able to have on this island here. And so they wintered here on this island for three whole months. Imagine the preaching that went on in those three months. It started in the, the chief of the island's home, you remember? Um, as uh, he came, he allowed them to lodge there. His father was sick, and Paul, um, through the Holy Ghost, healed his father of disease. Um, many others from the island came, the Bible says, and God allowed Paul to heal them all. Amen? And that's something that God did at this time in the Bible. He used these miraculous healings to point people to Jesus Christ. And Paul was a great instrument. And so here in verse 11, he talks about uh, they're getting ready to make their way up here. Now, I have a question. In all the studying that I've done in the Word of God, uh, we come to verse number 11. It says they wintered here for three months. 
And uh, they got back onto that ship of Alexandria, which, by the way, if you remember, the, the hinder part or the back part of the ship was broken up during that shipwreck. So I can imagine them having that ship up on stilts and stuff like that and doing work over the three months to be able to get that ship back to be worthy to sail once again. And, uh, but the, the Bible says here, as he mentions this ship, Alexandria, um, Paul says the sign of this ship was Castor and Pollux. Does anybody have any idea what that is? No one's ever looked at that before, right? Well, I'm going to give you some details on it. These were false gods of the Roman Empire. And uh, you consider um, Castor and Pollux, they typically went together. They're two separate gods that they worshipped, false gods, by the way. Um, they believe back in uh, 496 B.C., as they uh, went to battle with another group, these were gods that they had that were up in the uh, astrological field, up in stars. They had named some different stars after them. And Castor and Pollux, one of them was a horse trainer, false god, but one of them was portrayed as a horse trainer. The other one was portrayed as a boxing trainer. And these two false gods, um, according to the Roman uh, mythology, they were responsible for helping their sailors and their soldiers to be able to fight with the training of the horses and the training of the men. And I would show you an image of what these things look like, but most of these Greek images are they're horrific to look at because they just they they don't they, it's it's art that we don't want to look at and uh it's basically like i said two men um and over the centuries um this cult has uh, evolved um there are temples that worship um castor and pollux specifically and uh, it's a false god and this ship that paul is on he makes mention of it was named after these false gods that the romans were following after and that's interesting that Paul is the man of God on this voyage to Rome to spread the gospel, and yet the ship is named after a couple of false gods. Very interesting, uh, to say the least. Um, verse number 12, the Bible says, In landing at Syracuse, we tail, or tarried three days. You can see up here in, in uh, Sicily, uh, Syracuse is this very first stop right here. So they go from this island and they make their way not very far. They get over here uh, to Syracuse. They, they stay a few days, the Bible says. Verse number 13, and from thence we fetched a compass. That'd be a good thing to have, wouldn't it? Does anybody here own a compass? What? Wait, come on. It's on my phone. Well, the phones are going to go out. They're not going to work anymore. <coughs> Compasses are good to have. Now, uh, you know, us being in Southern California, we have some landmarks that we can look at to recognize what the north is and what the west is and all that. Um, but what happens if we go somewhere else and those landmarks don't exist for us? Um, you know, they make wristwatches that have compasses on them. Those are good. If you want to go hardcore, you can get one of those military compasses that fold up and go in your pocket. Those are pretty good, too. Got one of those. Um, one of my friends, they used to make quite a bit of fun of me because we'd go. We went up to Yosemite one year uh, with, a, with a church uh, group, a lot of people, about 25 families. And we did a family camp and we're there for a week. And uh, I had a friend that he loved to, he was from Colorado, he loved to go hiking around in the hills and the mountains and all this, and him and I served in the ministry for 17 years together. And we get there to Yosemite, and he says, okay, brother, uh, let's go get all the kids together, we're going to go on a hike somewhere. And I go, good thing, brother, bring them all in here and we'll, we'll get them going. And while he was going and getting the kids, I'm spreading out the topographical maps on the table of where we are. And, and showing them the compass and stuff. And it doesn't have names of city like this. It's topographical maps. It shows you uh, ridge tops and draws and depressions and, and what the land features look like so you can use those. And my brother was giving me a bad time about it. In fact, he was openly mocking me in front of my other Christian brothers as to me bringing these maps and having a compass and stuff. But I'll tell you this. It started to get dark like it did right about 5 o'clock when it started. The sun just started to go down. And I said, brother, we need to get back. Let's go get back. I'm going to pull up the tail. And he looks and we start walking and we get a little ways. And it wasn't long before he turns around and he's going, brother, we're lost. 
I said, you're lost, brother. <laughs> Let's break out the map and see where we are. And we were able to get back. And so I never let him live that down. He was able to get lost after mocking me. Uh, maps and compasses are good to have. And if you don't have those things, you're really putting yourself at risk uh, when you're traveling, especially like these guys are doing, right? And uh, uh, you get on the open ocean, some of... We, have, we don't have any of our Navy guys here tonight. You know, you get on open ocean, I couldn't even imagine looking out and you can't see anything. Which way are you supposed to go, you know? Um, well, they use the stars and all kinds of things. But nonetheless, they went and got a uh, compass here at this point so that they might be able to do a better job of uh, finding their way. Verse 13, once again, and from thence we fetched a compass and came to, who knows the name of this city right here? Who wants to try and pronounce it? Region. Okay, that's the official pronunciation. I wanted to see if I was the only one that would pronounce these things in a difficult manner. I looked at all these, and I'll tell you tonight, I look, all these names of these places, I got the Greek right in front of me, so I know how to pronounce them now. Um, but Regium, and so they get to this place here, right across the other side, they jump to this other uh, body of uh, land here, uh, Regium, and they're there. He goes on to tell us that once they uh, arrived there, after one day, the south wind blew, and we came next to... To, what's the name of that next city? Poltioli. 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 That's pretty good. I'm going to say Poltioli. That's pretty close to what the, the actual pronunciation of that is. And so they make their way from this island. They hit a couple of different land areas. And they land on this place right here, Poltioli. And they are going to be on footmobile the rest of the way to Rome from here. Right? So they've got off the Alexandria. They've landed here. Verse number 14. Where we found brethren and were desired to tarry with them seven days. And so we went toward Rome. And so you're, they land here. And man, they meet some brothers that have a like faith in Jesus Christ. Amen? I don't know if you've ever been traveling before and you're, you're kind of weary of not knowing anybody and you meet that stranger that's a brother in Christ or a sister in Christ. And it's like a breath of fresh air. And, uh, and maybe they're traveling too and they don't know anybody and you guys get to talk and whatnot. I've been there before. It's encouraging to get with other believers, even those people that you don't uh, actually know before you take your trip. The Bible says we found brethren and were desired to tarry with them seven days. And so we went towards Rome, verse 15. And from thence, when the brethren heard of us, they came to meet us as far as Appii Forum and the three taverns. And you look here where they land here in Puteoli. The Forum of Appii is right here. Thresh Tabernes is up here. These people travel a great distance. I mean, if we can look down here at the, uh, uh, the map as far as how many miles it was, close to 100 miles, I would say between 50 and 100 miles away, these people heard that Paul had hit the coastline, and man, they came down to meet with him. Other believers. And how exciting is this? Remember what Paul's journey is right now. He's being led to his death for the cause of Christ. And he knows this. And he's sharing the gospel with everybody that he can come in contact with. And he's just come off of this time of having this huge shipwreck that went on. He had a few months to recover. You know, if I was on a ship that crashed, I probably wouldn't be getting on another one. I'd be asking for the helicopter to come. Oh, we don't have helicopters in this day and age. Okay, well, uh, get me off this place right here. How, how far do I have to uh, jump to get across this island? I'd be thinking of everything before I got back on that ship. But you know what? They got back on that ship. Paul got back on that ship, didn't he? Knowing that he's going to Rome, but knowing that he's going to be led to his death. And I know every step of the way that Paul is being observant and walking circumspectly to see who God's going to allow him to talk with about the Lord. Amen? Amen? Do we walk like that each and every day? Where we're really paying enough attention to those people that are around us so the Holy Spirit can speak to us and say, hey, this person needs your attention? You know, I watched a video of a man the other day. We sometimes will walk by people on the streets and not even make eye contact with them at all. 
And this man, he had a sign in his hand, like a lot of people in L.A. do, right? He was just leaning up against a building like this, and he said, um, you know, the top of the sign said, Jesus loves you. And then there was a bunch of little writing that was underneath of it all the way down to the bottom, where he said, I don't need anything. I want to be a blessing to you. Take all the money that I have in this cup. And he had $1,000 in this plastic cup here, and he just stood there up against the wall. He said he literally watched more than a hundred people walk by him on the street without even looking his direction. Until one man came up and just said, hey brother, let me, I don't have much, let me, you know, and started talking with him. He didn't read the sign either. And the guy says, hold on, read the sign right here. And he read it. And the guy was like, I can't take that. I'm here to help you. And, And the man ended up forcing him to take the money and the man agreed to donate it somewhere else because he was there to help him. But you know, if we're not careful... We just go about our everyday business and we're not walking circumspectly and really paying attention to the people around us. And we need to pay attention to the people around us. These are the people that God... So if God's going to call us to witness to people, which He has, and then we got to understand by discernment as to who He's going to have us talk to, if we're not paying attention and giving Him opportunity to speak to us because we just have our head down, how are we ever going to be able to get involved with talking with anybody about the Lord? We've got to be paying attention. And I know Paul um, here is paying great attention. And man, what an amazing thing to have uh, believers trekking down um, from up in the region of Rome um, on footmobile. You know, I mean, maybe they have horses and carriages and whatever, but they come a long way. It's not like they had an automobile and they got there in an hour. They took a trip there because they knew this ship was landing and the Apostle Paul was, was there. Verse 15, once again, And from thence we, uh, when the brethren heard of us, they came to meet us as far as Appii Forum and the three taverns, whom when Paul saw, he thanked God and he took courage. We can't miss this. Paul is on his path of life and serving the King of Kings, knowing that his final destination is Rome and death is going to await him there. He doesn't know how he's going to die, but he knows that his life will be taken for his faith. And these other believers come to meet with him, to hug on him, to say, brother, good work. Praise God for you, brother, and and you courageously trekking around. I mean, all of his missionary journeys, the previous three missionary journeys are, are illustrated here. And Paul went to a great deal of the known world at this time, preaching the gospel in the face of adversity. And now where the gospel has never been preached, Paul has landed there. And God's going to be able to use him. And these believers, how do you think believers got here? Do you remember as we talked about the preaching and and all the things that were going on over here in Berea and Thessalonica and and Macedonia, the bigger region here? There were lots of people that were coming from these areas for different events that were happening over here that heard the gospel preached, you remember? Some of them even linked up with Paul and went with him on his uh, missionary journeys uh, as he continued to preach the gospel. And Paul has fellow believers coming down here. And what an encouragement that must have been for him. To know he's going to Rome and, man, there's people that have bent their knee to Jesus Christ that are here. Amen? And he's getting ready to go here and he took courage. Proverbs 27, 17. What does it say, Taryn? Amen. Iron sharpeneth iron, so a man sharpeneth the countenance of his friend. We help each other. You know that? And if we can encourage each other to serve God, we're sharpening one another. We're helping each other to be a better tool that God could use. And Paul is encouraged as he sees uh, these men coming here, and women, and I'm sure they're bringing uh, children, and he took courage from that. Would you ever consider doing that? Did you ever think about that? That we can take courage from other people around us? because of their encouraging words that they give to us? It's something that we typically don't consider. People will tell you to rise up and be courageous and and, and go do some things, but they're asking you to draw from yourself and, and to move forward. But you know, we can take courage from one another. We can take courage to go out and witness to those people when it when it feels a little uncomfortable. 
That man that I witnessed to this last week that I told you guys about, I'm certain that this man was possessed with demons. He was completely going off when I went up and talked to him about the Lord. Any, any time I was quoting Scripture and many, ma- mentioning the name of Jesus, boy, he was stopping his ears literally and just screaming as loud as he could. God calls each one of us to go to witness to somebody different, right? This man was shouting obscenities at me when I got out of my car. And the Holy Spirit said, "Uh, you need to go talk to him. Do you think I wanted to go talk to him? (laughs) My daughter says yes, because I did. I want to do what God wants me to do. And And I was with another brother, and I said, brother, you know what? He looked at him and he says, man, that dude looks awful upset and he's a big dude. And I said, yeah, okay, brother, you go on in there and take care of your business. I'm going to go over here and I'll be over here when you come out. And a lot of, a lot of things happened by the time our brother came out. But you know what? Um, we got to take courage. And you know what? I take courage from each one of you. You're an encouragement to me. Just coming and hearing the preaching of the Word of God, having fellowship and talking, and as we talk about Scripture and and encourage one another, I can take courage from that. And I know that you can take courage as we interact from one another as well, so that we might be able to serve the King in a great way. However He's called each one of us. He may not call one of you to go and talk, talk, you know, chat it up with some crazy guy. Okay, if I would see that and my wife was with me, I would tell my wife, don't go over there, I'm going to go over there and talk with him. All right, we got to be careful and make sure we're safe in what we're doing. But if we're not paying attention to the people around us, how are we going to know who God wants us to talk to? We're not going to be able to. And Paul here, he's so encouraged by these other believers. And what's exciting for me as I see this, the Word of God was preached and went out throughout the world. And because of that, These men and women that came to him were able to encourage him. Amen? The Word of God is is much bigger than us. We think, well, what can I do? How can I do something? Well, consider the world at this time. And Jesus Christ being on this earth and not soon before all these actions have taken place, He was crucified upon the cross of Calvary. People hated Christians. It went against most everything that they had believed previously. You know why? There was a change in dispensations when Christ came to this earth. There were a lot of things that were put in play in the Old Testament that when Jesus came, if you remember when He went to the cross and He said, it is finished, the veil was rent in twain that was there in the temple that separated the Holy of Holies from the rest of the temple. The times had changed. Sacrifices were no longer needed because the final sacrifice, Jesus Christ, had given His life upon the cross of Calvary. And the veil was rent in twain from top to bottom, eliminating that process from our worship with God. And the people were offended by that. You understand that? They couldn't understand why somebody would come and say that God is telling us now that we need to follow Jesus. Imagine that. They had been following the law of Moses for a long time. But remember, it was all pointing to Jesus Christ, wasn't it? And they got caught up in following these things. And you know what? They added a bunch of ritualistic stuff and traditions and and they kind of lost focus on looking for the Lord Jesus Christ to come. And so when He came, they didn't recognize Him, they didn't understand Him, they were offended by Him, and they were offended by the Christians that walk on this planet. Verse number 16 of Romans chapter number 28. And when we came to Rome, the centurion delivered the prisoners to the captain of the guard, but Paul was suffered to dwell by himself with a soldier that kept him. Paul getting special treatment once again. Isn't that awesome to see that? Paul is getting special treatment. He's not lumped in with all the other people. Verse 17, And it came to pass that after three days, Paul called the chief of the Jews together. What? These are the people that wanted to kill him. These are the ones that have been trailing him all over this map trying to take his life. Many of them were present when they stoned him and dragged him out of the city thinking he was dead. And Paul makes his way all the way to Rome here. And he gets settled in. And he calls for the chiefs of the Jews. This is crazy to me. But Paul knows he's on his last journey, doesn't he? 
And so he calls for the chief. You wonder why would he do such a thing? We well, called for the chief of the Jews together, and when they were come together, he said unto them, Men and brethren, though I have committed nothing against the people or customs of our fathers. You see what he's doing here? He's a part of who they are. He's trying to tell them of the different time that has now arrived because Jesus Christ, the Son of God, has arrived on this planet. And he says, I followed these things and the customs of our fathers, yet was I delivered prisoner from Jerusalem into the hands of the Romans. He said, man, I've done nothing wrong. If you look at his faith and <clears throat> him studying and being a, an Old Testament believer, if you will, man, he was over the top and zealous for God. But he didn't understand really who God was and he didn't see the coming of Jesus Christ as Jesus came. You remember, as Jesus met him on the road to Damascus, Paul didn't recognize who it was immediately, did he? But man, Jesus made himself known to him and said, Paul, why, why kickest thou against the pricks? Why persecutest thou me? Jesus saying that to Paul. Imagine if you heard the words of our Lord say that because of my actions or your actions. I can understand the deep conviction that Paul had to go out and do whatever it took, no matter what it took, no matter what he faced. He talked with the Lord himself. And he's here in this place and he calls the chief Jews together, verse number 18, who when they had examined me would have let me go because there was no cause of death in me. And you remember that as he talked with uh, Agrippa and, and Festus and the other governors and, and nobody could find that he did anything wrong. In fact, man, Agrippa was like, this guy would have been set at liberty if he wouldn't have cried out that he needed to go see Caesar. We'd have been cutting him loose from here. But Paul knew what God's will for his life was, didn't he? He knew that God said he was going to Rome. You know what? He got, a, he got a free ride, didn't he? That's a long way to go, by the way. From Jerusalem to Rome. I don't know what the fare would be to get there. But Paul got to travel for free. Doing God's will. Now I know he, he got, had to uh, rack himself on some boards in the ocean a few times, right? But he got a free trip there. You with me? God took him there. We talked a little bit this morning about the promise, and you know, God has called us to do some things. Do we really believe that God is going to provide and keep us safe as we're doing those things? Or are we going to start freaking out and becoming real anxious because we're looking around us and worried about what the circumstances are around us? Man, if I was Paul and I was watching what was going on as a human being, I'd have bailed out of this a long time ago if it wasn't for the Lord. But he knew that his mission was for God himself. Verse number 19. But when the Jews spake against it, I was constrained to appeal unto Caesar. Not that I had aught to accuse my nation of. For this cause, therefore, have I called for you to see you and to speak with you. Because that for the hope of Israel, I am bound with this chain. Paul saying, I'm going to get it out to you. You're going to listen to me. And you're going to listen to what God has for you. And He sent me here with a very purpose. And I'm going to fulfill that. And He's talking to the leaders of the Jews here. You know, pretty bold for Paul to be speaking in this way. He's in bonds. He's in chains. And yet he's acting like he's the one with the authority. Why? Because he is the one with the authority, isn't he? He's acting on the behalf of Jesus Christ. You know, they were, so many people were surprised as Jesus taught in the temple and they said, man, look at this dude. He's, what authority he teaches with. And well, of course, he's God himself. He has all the authority. And, and God has given that to us and he's called us to be ambassadors for him. And so he's given us that authority. You know, as we look at ambassadors that represent the United States of America and they go out to these other uh, countries, um, uh, they are provided the way to be able to get there and represent and they're taken care of and, and they're supposed to be doing a good job in representing, aren't they? We need to be doing a much better job in representing for Jesus Christ than somebody representing the United States of America. And you know, when an ambassador from the United States is going to another country, you know what they're supposed to do? They're supposed to talk about America. I watched a propaganda film that was only about five minutes long that North Korea had recently produced. And they showed 
places in America, they're trying to convince their people of something for whatever, for whatever reason. They're showing places of America where we have up tents. And I mean like a you know, 100-man tent, like a tent we would put out here for our, our missions conference. You know, a big white tent, walls, whatever. And they show some people walking into the tent and the narrator saying, yeah, the people in America, this is how they have to live. And then they show a, a house that's been blown down and damaged and they, they say, yep, the Americans don't know how to build houses. Their houses blow down very easily so they have to live in tents. And then they show people in the snow and, and, and you know, uh, sitting on the benches and drinking coffee in the snow. And some of them have some, uh, uh, those blue tarps that we could put over things, right? And they're, they're folded up. And the narrative says this, these people are so poor in America, they're drinking snow that had been melted in those cups that they have. And those blue bags that are beside them on those benches are their fellow friends that have already passed away. This is propaganda. Like, I'm watching this going... What? Like a, and, then, and then they show them, they, they literally show a, 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 I don't know what to call it, like a taco wagon, a, a gut truck, a, you know, somewhere where you could buy burritos and tacos or whatever. Somebody drives up on the road, they, they show one of them, and it's, it's cold because they're back somewhere where there's snow on the ground. And boy, they're telling people there's snow everywhere, it's freezing, uh, Americans are dying because of the cold. And praise God, they said, North Korea has made a donation so that everybody in America could get a free cup of hot snow and they watch these people going up and get a cup of coffee and walking away right crazy you ever seen a uh, an old school phone booth abandoned they're all over the place right old school phone booths that were used to be on the corners and whatever and i've taken pictures of them when i've been out at different places just because it's kind of funny to see when i'll act like i'm talking and send it to my wife and stuff and whatever they showed some of these old abandoned phones and some homeless guys laying down in front of them and said you know what this is what america's like and there's no phones there anymore because there's nobody to call this is what north korea is telling their people and then they go on to say, they show another line of people, you know, getting a, a, you know, I don't know where it was, it was a food truck, and they're getting, you know, what looks like a little cake, and they're saying, yeah, because of North Korea, we've sent them money, and now everybody in this region can get a hot cup of snow and a cake. What? But you know what, we consider the things that are true and the things that are false that are out there, and there are so many that are proclaiming falsehoods. And when we consider Paul and his journey, um, and even his journey to Rome, there were a lot of things that were said about Christians that were completely inaccurate, even about Jesus Christ himself as they accused him and, and uh, tormented him. And of course, the believers now uh, on the face of the earth, and you know what, we get to experience this today too. All over the planet, Christians lose their lives just for their faith. And we may not see it on the 5 o'clock news here all the time. That's because our news people don't report news anymore. Okay, they, they report a bunch of nonsense, and they're trying to pull the same garbage that North Korea is pulling on their people by putting out a narrative and some things that they can try and guide the minds of the people. And we have to be careful with that. And Paul is here understanding that there, remember the, one of the, the soldiers that was guarding Paul and Paul told him he was a Christian and witnessed to him. The soldier said, what? Man, I, I thought you were a, the, the leader of 4,000 murderers. That's what I was told. And all the murderers are out in the wilderness and you're getting ready to call them to go take action. People are saying some horrible things about Christians. And even as Paul gets here to Rome, he knows that. And he calls for these Jews here so that he could speak with them plainly on the mission that God has given them. Verse number 21, And they said unto him, We neither received letters out of Judea concerning thee, neither any of the brethren that came showed or spake any harm of thee. But we desire to hear of thee what thou thinkest. For as concerning this sect, they're calling Christianity a sect here as Paul is talking with them, as concerning this sect, we know that everywhere it is spoken against. Everywhere. People are talking horrible about who Jesus is and putting down the people that are following our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. This is the crowd that Paul's witnessing to here. And he calls for these people that wanted to take his life. He calls for them, which is, which is crazy to me. But you know what? These are the people that Paul was used to associating with. And he had a love for them. 
I don't know, for you guys in your life and where you've been, you know what? I didn't get saved in Southern California. I was born and raised here. I got to join the military and go travel around in different places in Europe and, and back to the United States. And when I got back here, man, there was so much chaos going on with all my friends and, and half of them were locked up in prison. I said, man, I can't stay here. I'm going to end up just like them. That's the only reason I left this place. I didn't want to end up like they were. God had a plan for me. He took me to Washington State to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. But as I lived there for a short time, I had a burden for the people in Southern California. Because this is where I was born and raised. I first went back to the old high school that I went to. I was a youth pastor for a church pretty close to there and went back. But this is what Paul's going through here. He loves the Jews, even though they were after him. The Pharisees, and say, even though they were after him. He was one of them. And he's here trying to convince them, even as he makes his way here to Rome, and they tell him, man, we've heard nothing but bad things about you and the God that you follow. Verse 23, And when they had appointed him a day, there came many to him in his lodging, to whom he expounded and testified the kingdom of God, persuading them concerning Jesus, both out of the law of Moses and out of the prophets, from morning till evening. That's all Paul did was Paul said, you know what? I'm arrested. I'm in custody. I'm not going anywhere. God's put me in this spot. I'm not going to look to go anywhere else. I'm going to preach the gospel to everybody that I can while I'm here. That ought to be our goal and where we are. I'm going I'm to talk it up as much as I can with everybody. And you know what? If I don't feel good about talking about it all the time and I don't have the words, and I, I'm going to just be passing out tracts. Remember how that works? Remember? The, you stick something out in front of somebody. Typically, they just go... <laughs> and they receive what you give them. You know, they might crumble it up and throw it on the ground afterwards, but you know what? They're going to receive it. We can do that. We can pass those things out. Paul is here from morning till evening persuading people about Jesus Christ. His whole goal in life. And I believe in my heart that Paul was able to remain fired up for the King of Kings as he was in custody in Rome awaiting his fate because he was able to take courage from those other believers that he met with. They were able to prop him up a little bit. Slap him on the back. Say, Paul, I don't, I don't know. We're going we're gonna to go to the king on your behalf and pray for your safety. And Paul's saying, you know what? I'm, I'm going to Rome. This is where God has called me to go and I'm going. And he's here in this place preaching from morning till evening. And I want to take you back up to the top of verse 23 because I don't want you to miss this. And when they had appointed him a day, there came many to him into his lodging. Paul had private accommodations. Paul had a house he lived in. What? Yes. He was under arrest in Rome awaiting his fate, but yet he had his own dwelling place. And they allowed people to come and go freely even knowing that he was a Christian and what he was doing. That's miraculous. These people in Rome hate Christians. You know why? Because they're stirring up things in the kingdom. They don't want any turmoil in the kingdom. And man, ever since these Christians came on the scene, ever since Jesus Christ arrived on the scene, man, there's been turmoil everywhere that they know because of them. Paul's got his own place to stay. And he's witnessing for our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Listen to what verse 24 says here. And some believed the things which were spoken. Some people believe. Because of the words that you and I will share with somebody about Jesus Christ, some will believe. It'll add to what other people have already uh, sowed or what other people have already watered. We say, well, I didn't get much time to talk to that person. I was like, but you know what? You don't know what's went on in their life and what God has already given them. Some people will believe as we share the gospel with them. But remember what the end of verse 24 says, and some believe not. There were some that were probably kicking dirt at them as they left this place. Them, well, I can't believe you're doing this here and whatever. You know what? That's the way it's going to be. Some people are not going to believe. And we can't pine away for it in our own hearts. We've got to just continue to share the message when they're before us. And those that uh, don't believe, we need to keep sharing the message with them. 
I, I, I'll share this again, the testimony of my father. When I got saved and, and man came home and tried to witness to him, he was like, don't say another word. Don't say another word. And my, my kids don't know my, my dad, their grandpa like that. Before he was saved, he was harsh. He was brutal. And I was a young man, and, and I'd already went around in circles with him as a teenager, and I don't want to mess with him. But you know what? God gave me the courage every single time to stand before him and go, Dad, <laughs> you, you really need the Lord. I, I want to talk with you about him. And I would, I would give him a track every single time. And you know what he'd do? He would take it and he'd go... He had a bar in his house. That's where I typically would meet with him at. In his, in his den, they had a bar. And I know my kids, if Grandpa was already saved as the kids were growing up and they never got to see uh, people full on drinking at this bar he had in his house. But he would just slap it down there and get out of my face. And I re- I'll never forget, 17 years after I got saved, when I came home to witness to my dad yet again, He took that track and he did the very same thing. The next morning he woke up and he said, Son, I prayed last night that prayer on the back of that track to receive Christ. And it wasn't just the words that I'd been giving him. There's a lot of history that goes on and putting other people in his life. Man, they they took, he was a truck driver, they took him out of a truck and they platted him in an office as a dispatcher. One of the worst jobs he'd ever think he'd do, having to sit in a chair. He was a truck driver. Brother West, would you like to sit in a chair being a dispatcher or driving a truck, right? Amen. And so my dad's there. Well, who do you think's planted next to him? Someone who used to be a Baptist preacher. And he had to listen to that guy every day for a whole year. I didn't live here then. I lived up north. And I remember coming home. And after my dad shares with me, he bent his knee. I'm like, Dad, like, it didn't make sense to me. He doesn't want to punch me over it today. What? Like, and he told me the story. You know what? God put this man next to me, man, and he, he kept telling me all those same things you've been telling me when you come, and he wouldn't be quiet about it. And I couldn't leave because we worked in the same office right next to each other. He was a dispatcher of the north. The other guy was a dispatcher of the south. Don't give up on the people around you. It doesn't matter how harsh they are. It doesn't matter if they throw a drink on you, kick dirt on you. God says we need to continue to go. Some will believe. Some won't, but while we're here, we need to continue to tell them. Amen? Verse 25, And when they agreed not amongst themselves, they departed. After that, Paul had spoken one word, Well spake the Holy Ghost by Isaiah the prophet unto our fathers, saying, Go unto this people and say, Hearing ye shall hear and shall not understand, and seeing ye shall see, and not perceive. You know, if you read through Matthew chapter 13 today, I preached a message from Matthew chapter 13, but we were down in verse 36 and below that. If you look up above in verses about 7 through 11, it says these very same things here. Some will will hear, but they won't really hear. Some will be able to see, but they're really not perceiving what's going on. And it's the Holy Ghost that's going to intervene over and over and over and over and over again until their fleshy heart is broken by that and the light bulb goes on for them. And they realize the message that you're really proclaiming to them. And Paul here is quoting this from Isaiah here. Verse number 27, For the heart of this people is wax gross, and their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes they have closed, lest they should see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and should be converted, and I shall heal them. Paul is just doing what God told him to do, isn't he? Jesus Christ speaking. I can't go past this without reading it. Jesus Christ Himself speaking in Matthew chapter 13 and verse number 14. And in them is fulfilled the prophecy of Esaias, which saith, By hearing ye shall hear, and shall not understand, and see ye shall not see. And ye shall see and shall not perceive. For this people's heart is wax gross, and their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes uh, they have closed, lest at any time their eyes are opened, and they should understand with their heart, and should be converted, and I should heal them. Jesus Christ is saying the exact same thing that Paul is saying while he's here in Rome. Word for word. 
Man, Paul's following the pattern, isn't he? He's following his Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And it's amazing to see that he literally follows those steps that Jesus had called out for him to follow. And he's reasoning with them in the same manner that Christ so often reasoned with, or reasoned with the multitudes. That's amazing. The Holy Spirit is working in Paul's life in order for that to line up, right? And as we see ourselves go throughout our lives and, and interact with people and are compelled to tell them about the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, we can know that the Holy Ghost is working in us too. Because before I was saved, I, I could give a rip about anybody else. My money was mine. I earned my stuff. I, I keep me safe and my people. And no, you, know, you don't worry about anybody else. You're not concerned about anybody else. But once you bend your knee to Jesus Christ and you experience Jesus' love, man, it changes your perspective. You then start giving out that love that Jesus Christ has given to you. I care about everybody around me now. Sometimes less in moments in my life. Amen. But you know what? I got to get past that. And I got to do what the King of Kings tells me to do. And Paul is doing just that. And he's doing it by presenting the Word of God. Verse number 28 Be it known, therefore, unto you that the salvation of God is sent unto the Gentiles, and that they will hear it. Pretty offensive to say to the, the Sadducees and the Pharisees, huh? The Jewish sect that's here. So man, the, the Gentiles, those low down no goods that nobody wants to have anything to do with. Boy, they're listening and they're receiving Christ as Savior. Verse number 29, And when he had said these words, the Jews departed and had great reasoning among themselves. This is what the Word of God will do in the hearts of people that we share it with. They're going to walk away and they're going to be scratching their heads. And if the Holy Spirit so directs, man, they're going to start talking with other people in their circle about what they just experienced. And like, what? This guy was saying this to me? Have you ever heard this? I use that as a, a way to witness to people at times. I'll, I'll speak in the third person. And I'll say, well, let me tell you this, brother or sister. I had a person tell me that Jesus is the only way and that He is the truth and that He is the life. And no man gets to go to heaven or to the Father, except through Jesus Christ. Somebody told me that. Now, I'm not lying, am I? I've heard that before. I bent my knee to Christ as a result of it. But you know, as we consider talking to people, there's a lot of different ways that we can talk with them, but God is going to use His words to stir up some things within them where they're going to walk away and they're going to think about those things. They're definitely going to think about them at the Day of Judgment. And hopefully, they're appearing before Jesus Christ on Judgment Day as a believer, and not before God Almighty at the great white throne judgment where they're going to be cast into hell. Either place that they're going to be, they're going to remember the conversations that we've had with them. We just need to share the Word of God just as Paul is doing, just as he followed the pattern that Jesus Himself used. Verse number 30, And Paul dwelt two whole years in his own hired house and received all that came in unto him. Can you imagine all the different walks of life that must have come and wanted to see who this guy Paul was? Remember we talked about having a reputation and contrasting that with the character traits we should have in our life? Paul's got some amazing godly character traits in his life. And as a result of that, Paul had a reputation too. And I know people came wanting to figure out, who is this guy? Man, this guy got stoned. He got shipwrecked. He got, you know, and they think about all these things that happened to him. Paul received every single one of them. The people coming in wanting to curse him out. People wanting to kick dirt on him probably. Man, he received every one of them. And he was there for two whole years in his own hired house. What was he doing? Verse 31, he was preaching the kingdom of God and teaching those things which concern the Lord Jesus Christ with all confidence, no man forbidding him. That's amazing. Being under arrest, being in Rome, and being able to be in this place where God has brought him and planted him in his own hired house, 
And yet he's able to share the gospel with all those that come before him. But don't forget, Paul took courage. Amen? From the believers around him. <clears throat> now, are we always going to be able to take courage from believers around us? Might not have anybody around us at times. We might be in a position where we're, we're not communicating with folks around us and we can't take that courage with them. You want to read about taking courage from the Lord? Go into 1 Samuel chapter 30 and read about David when all the warriors came into that town called Ziklag and took all their women and their children while they were out fighting a battle. And they got to show up back home and nobody was there. The people that David was serving with as soldiers wanted to stone him. They wanted to kill him because all of their family was carted away. But the Bible says that David took courage in the Lord. And he moved forward and God said, you know what? I'm going to restore everything that's been taken from you. It's all going to be given back to you. Read that story, 1 Samuel chapter 30. I'll preach on it here um, sometime here in the near future. But David took courage from the Lord because everybody else around him was turning on him. And God provided him the courage to move forward and rally the troops and go out and take care of business. Let's take courage from each other. Amen? Let's take courage from the Lord to do the things that He's called us to do. Let's pray. Father, You are so very good to us. We thank You for the study of Your Word. We thank You for the truth of it. Lord, we thank You for the motivation that You give us as we study it and proclaim it. We pray that You'd help each one of us in here to take courage to move through our circumstances, to move through those challenging experiences that we are dealing with right this moment in life. That You'd help us to be able to stay focused on You and to look for those opportunities that You give us to share the glorious gospel with another soul. We love you, Lord. Protect us with safety as we go, for we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.